This is a WMUR Commitment 2020 special in partnership with the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Conversation with the candidate. Tonight, Senator Elizabeth Warren. Good evening and welcome to our Conversation with the Candidate series. I'm Adam Sexton and our guest this evening is Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. Tonight we'll be getting to know the Senator and where she can, stands on key issues. At the start of our show, I'll be asking the candidates some questions. And then after a break, we'll have our studio audience ask their questions in a town hall format. But before we begin with that, let's take a quick look at the candidate's biography. Elizabeth Warren was born in Oklahoma City in 1949 and graduated from the University of Houston. After getting her bachelor's degree, Warren started teaching children with special needs at a public elementary school. When her daughter turned two, Warren enrolled in law school and graduated with a degree from Rutgers University. She practiced law out of her living room, but then became a professor, teaching at Rutgers, the universities of Houston, Texas, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and finally Harvard. From 2008 to 2010, during the Great Recession, Warren chaired the Congressional Oversight Panel for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, before acting as the Special Assistant to President Obama for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. She was elected as a Democrat to the U.S. Senate for Massachusetts in 2012 and re-elected in 2018. She lives with her husband in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and has three grandchildren. Senator Warren, thank you for joining us on Conversation thank with you. the Candidate. It's good to be here. We appreciate your time. Thank you. So you've risen in this race on the strength of your ideas. Elizabeth Warren has a plan for that, has become part of the lexicon of the 2020 race, which must thrill you. And perhaps this entire race will play out on the merits and on the ideas. I sure hope so. But how will voters know when you, that you're ready for when the race does become a fight for who wins? So, you know, I've been around this block before. Um, and that's back in the 2012 race in Massachusetts. Um, I had done the Congressional Oversight Panel. Uh, President Obama had asked me to set up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, and I'd spent a year doing that. And then the Republicans said, you're never going to get confirmed to be the permanent director of it. So I said, okay, and I'm going back to Massachusetts, and I'm going to do what I do. I'm going back to teaching. And bunch of people started calling me. Uh, Scott Brown, who you know, of course, here in New Hampshire as well. Scott Brown uh, was the senator from Massachusetts, and Massachusetts likes its moderate Republicans. And um, he was going to run for re-election. He had just beaten a woman not too long before then. He had a 65% approval rating. He had more than $10 million in the bank already. And people called and said, look, nobody's going to beat this guy. But you could, you know, get in the race, get in the race. And then they'd say to me, of course, you're not going to win either. Um, which I got to say, Democrats get a better sales pitch here. But um, I jumped in the race and I knew why I was running. I knew about the things I'm fighting for. And here was the commitment I made to myself on the first day, every single day, I would go out and talk to people about something that mattered. So big group, little group, whatever I could get together, i go out and talk about student loans. i go out and talk about child care. i go out and talk about health care. i go to out and talk about uh, climate change. i go out and talk about gun safety every single day. The second thing I did is every time I met a little girl, I would go down on one knee. I'd say, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm running for the Senate because that's what girls do. And then we do pinky promises that we get out there and fight for what we believe in. I started out 17 points down, and I ended up beating him by seven and a half. You know, I grew up in a pretty hard scrabble family, and I learned early on, you don't get what you don't fight for. I know how to fight and I know how to win. A lot of the more progressive candidates tend to brush off this question, but a lot of people are concerned that this primary is moving too far to the left, that whoever comes out of this process for the Democrats will be too far to the left to win in a general election. What do you say to those voters on the Democratic side who have that concern? Well, I think a lot of the old left-right politics, frankly, just don't apply much anymore. Let me give you a couple of examples. So I came out for a two-cent wealth tax. This is, this is my design. This is a tax 
on the top one-tenth of one percent of the great fortunes in this country. Your first 50 million, you keep free and clear. But after that, your 50 millionth and first dollar, you gotta pitch in a penny and a penny for every dollar after that. It's just like a property tax, like any homeowner pays. Only for the bazillionaires, you also cover the yachts, the stock portfolio, the diamonds, and the Rembrandts. So, first of all, that wealth tax all by itself is popular across this country, not just with Democrats, but with independents and with Republicans who recognize this economy has gotten way out of balance and that that thin slice at the top, they're not paying a fair share. The 99% last year, all in, paid about 7.2% of their total wealth in taxes. That thin slice paid about 3.2%. So asking them to pitch in two cents, that's popular Democrats and Republicans. And now just look at some of the things you can do for it. Um, we could cancel student loan debt for about 95% of the kids who have student loan debt. Again, that's not just popular with Democrats, that's popular with Democrats and Republicans. Childcare for all of our babies, age zero to five, pre-K for all three-year-olds and four-year-olds. These are the kinds of investments that America wants to see. So I think of this as not direction moving so much about left, right, although it's fine if you want to describe it that way. I think of it as we're getting more in sync with where working people are in New Hampshire and all across this country. You were the first presidential candidate to call for the impeachment of President Donald Trump oh, after the release of the summary of the Mueller report. Why isn't the 2020 election an adequate trial for President Trump, if you will? A actually, let me just make sure we're, we're the same on the facts. I didn't call for it after the summary. Um, I sat down to read the report. I had never expected to get into a presidential race and make it about impeachment. I said I'm taking him on in 2020. But the day the report came out, I sat down and I started reading it. And I read all the way through into the evening, into the night, early the next morning, and into the afternoon. I read all 448 pages of the report. And when I got to the end, it was perfectly clear. Robert Mueller said, first, a hostile foreign government attacked our 2016 election with the intent of helping Donald Trump. And it's documented, it's footnote, it's got testimony, it's got written evidence, it's all there. Part two, Donald Trump welcomed that help. And again, plenty of footnotes, plenty of documentation. And part three, when our federal government went to investigate part one and part two, and Donald Trump was now president, he did everything he could to obstruct that investigation. Uh, Special Prosecutor Mueller makes 10 separate counts in which he, again, documents, footnotes, and says, here's what he did. At the end, Mueller says, it's not up to me. This is a question for the Congress of the United States of America. I get that there are a lot of people for political reasons who say, don't do this, but for me, some things are a lot bigger than politics. And one of them is stepping up and saying no one is above the law, and that includes the President of the United States. When he uses his office to obstruct justice repeatedly, then this is an impeachable offense. And this matters not just for Donald Trump, this matters for the next president and the one after that and the one after that. For me, it's a moment when everyone who's been elected to Congress, House and Senate, should have to just step up and vote and then live with the consequences of that vote for the rest of their lives. Senator Warren, thank you for answering these questions. There thank are you. more to come, of course. After the break, we'll bring our studio audience into this conversation. Stay with us.